The Community Impact and Tikkun Olam Committee is going to have a special meeting this Sunday at noon in the Temple Library. Uh, come and learn about possible projects with Everyone's Garden, which is a community garden near us. Poppy Sales, which will support about 150 homeless veterans in our area. And exciting technology for people who could use a little help hearing, along with a chance to experience that technology. The Birmingham Temple Walk for Hearing team donations will help the temple to get that technology. There will also be three speakers. Terry Krutz, who will speak about the induction loop, which is an awesome assistive listening technology, and you'll have an opportunity to experience. Herman Sherline, who is the winner of the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Service Award on helping homeless veterans, and Sharon Burke of Everyone's Garden, which is in Berkeley, Michigan. The Reading Circle will meet on May the 3rd, that's tomorrow, at 11 a.m., I believe also in the library. And this month's book is As a Driven Leaf by Malcolm Steinberg. Our last Trivachi concert for this spring season is Paul Vandiziano on classical guitar. That is on May the 10th at 8 p.m., I believe that's a Saturday evening. Don't miss out, get your tickets now. And Joyce has some tickets, she's right here, so see her after services if you're interested in tickets for that event. Every temple member should have received two tickets to the spring get-together and auction in the mail. Please be certain to send in your payment to reserve your spot at the auction, and that event is May the 17th. Please also join us on May the 9th for a family potluck dinner beginning at 6.30. You should bring along your favorite Israeli dish or any other dish to pass. <laughs> Shabbat service will be in recognition of Israel Independence Day. Rabbi Felix will address the topic, Jewish and Democratic, how Israel can be both. And I would be extremely remiss if I did not point out to the members of our congregation that we are joined tonight by members of the Society for Humanistic Judaism Board, on which I've been very proud to serve for about the past five or six years and continue to serve and if you see someone you don't know, would you please greet them at the Omega after service? Thank you so much. Shabbat shalom. I also want to welcome my colleagues and friends from the SHJ board. We're really happy to have you here. Please make every effort to attend, those of you from BT, next week for Yom Ha'atzma'ud, Israel Independence Day, 6.30 for a potluck. And then at this speech that I'm going to be making, a more of an informal talk than usual. The following week, I'm going to be talking about Yaakov Malkin's new book about Epicure. You can't read it because it's only in Hebrew, but I'll tell you everything it says. And then the week after that, I'm going to be talking about moral relativism, one of the big boogeymen of our society, and uh, something you've probably heard Bill O'Reilly talk about, those horrible secular humanists and their moral relativism. So what is it? Are we really guilty? So I hope you'll join me for that. And then the following week, the last of our, of our Friday nights during May, will be our Shavuot, sort of salute to Shavuot, with a very special speaker. I've really, please talk this up. We're bringing somebody in from out of town. Her name is Leah Vincent. She is a formerly ultra-Orthodox Jew. She wrote a book called, um, now just... Thank you. And it's a magnificent story of a young woman's effort to cut me loose. Um, about her story of what it was like to basically be kicked out because she, I'll give you a hint, she talked to a boy. So um, I'm sure she'll, she'll be less flippant about it because it was not, uh, it was not a happy thing for her when it would occur. But anyway, she uh, went, went on to go to Harvard and is uh, I'm, I'm just a very exciting person to know. We really, really want to turn out a lot of people for that, so that's May 30th. So May is going to be very exciting. I hope you'll talk to everybody and make sure we get good attendances. Uh, our readers tonight are friends and uh, most of the officers, if not all, on the executive committee. Sheila Malcolm from Colorado. Marty Keller, who is not from Georgia but lives there. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Rubin from Boston.
Austin, Larry Lawrence from Washington, D.C., Rabbi Miriam Jarris from around here, Bonnie Cousins also from around here, Lou Altman from Chicago and Sarasota, and Andrea Friedlander from Chicago. And I'm going to invite the members of our executive committee to join me, well actually uh, come around or you can do it from down there, to light the candles. service by reading the Shabbat. Let's sing together in the Chagodi. We'll sing the first line twice and the second line twice as well. Shabbat, Shabbat has kept the Jews. On Shabbat we celebrate the gift of life and possibility. On Shabbat we put aside conflict and make peace with one another. On Shabbat we draw renewed sustenance from the love of family and friends. Please join me in singing my Yafe Hayom.
Jews were called the chosen people. Today, we are the choosing people. And for a tiny group which barely registers on the world's demographics, there are a surprisingly large number of choices. Whether Jewish by birth or by a conscious desire to join our ancient people, we Jews share a thick culture. It is varied enough that we do not all experience our Jewishness in the same way. Some see their Jewish identity as a matter of religious affiliation. Others feel most Jewish when they experience our culture's humor or food. Many believe that the Jewish experience is responsible for their eth ethical concerns, their intellectual curiosity, or their commitments to work for justice and equality. For yet others, the benefits of being Jewish lie in the sense of community it provides. Anyone who cares about Jewish life wants to see it flourish. An ethical life requires us to respect the choices of others. A Jewish future requires us to provide choices that Jews can respect. <coughs> Let's all sing together Hanyamni, Cholfim, first in Hebrew and then in English. <laughs> Relationship with their culture. 
For some, secular Jewish identity manifested itself in nationalism. Whether they belonged to the Yiddishist Yiddish Bundists or the Hebraic Zionists, being Jewish meant being part of a nation. Secularism also encouraged Jews to immerse themselves in Jewish history, literature, music, drama, dance, language, humor, and food. In every human endeavor, they sought a Jewish twist. One great man even recast Judaism's religious heritage in a secular mold. He called it secular humanistic Judaism. And now let's sing these words written by Rabbi Sherman Wine. Where is my life a full or <laughs> Oh, 
The pressing matter for us as Jews is not whether there will be a Jewish future, but what kind of future there will be. In some ways, the Jewish community is as divided and unsure of itself as it was during the decades after the destruction of the temple. Competing ideas abound, and each Jewish faction, whether motivated by theological claims or a sociological framework, believes that it provides the key to Jewish continuity. The truth is that there exists no key to Jewish survival. Unconstrained by ghettoization, Jews are free to travel their own paths. Many, long ago, abandoned any sense of duty or obligation to Jewish life of any kind. Humanistic Judaism offers itself as one possible avenue of Jewish commitment, specially designed for free thinkers. But humanistic Judaism, if it is to remain a viable alternative, must be as Jewish as it is humanistic. For while humanism may serve as the source of our values, it is Judaism that gives value to our lives. And let's sing together the song of celebration. <laughs>
all those who need our love and support, those who are ill, those who suffer pain of the body or spirit, those who are lonely, those who have been wronged. Tonight we call to mind these members of our congregation, Andrea DeMore Braver, Anne Ellen Bogan, Bobby Litwin, and Steve Marco. Together with anybody that you'd like to mention, please raise your hand as we go around. Floyd, keep your hands Pamela Bonner Murphy. Pat Otis. Anybody else on the side? No? May all who suffer know that they are not alone. May they be healed quickly. May they experience a complete recovery. The renewal of body and the renewal of spirit. And now let's sing together. <laughs>
Those who have been mentioned or anybody else whom you hold in your heart, please join me. May the memory of each of these beloved people provide us each and every day with a blessing. If you can do so comfortably, please rise now for a few minutes of knowledge. Nit kadal, benit kadash, beruach haadam. Let us enhance and exalt ourselves in the spirit of humanity. Let us acclaim the preciousness of life. Let us show gratitude for life by approaching it with reverence. Let us embrace the whole world, even as we wrestle with its hearts. Let us, each in our own way, take up our share in serving the world and seeking truth. May our commitment to life help us to strengthen healing of spirit and peace of mind. May healing and peace permeate and comfort all of Israel and all of those who dwell on earth. And let us say, King Yehi, May it be so. Please be seated. We're so happy to have our SHJ visitors share Shabbat with us. Um, and if, if you haven't been here before, you, you might not know that we have a spot for special music in the service right before the talk. Um, and we try to tie it in somehow. We try to tie it in somehow with a theme or, or, or something that's being discussed. Uh, tonight, we're going to see a presentation by Mark Cousins about touching on the history of the Birmingham Temple. And with that in mind, I chose a special song. Uh, it's not a song about the Birmingham Temple. It doesn't come from old Jewish liturgy. It's not in Yiddish. It's not in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. However, it comes from a long, long, over century long tradition of Jewish music from Broadway and Hollywood. Um, as you know, most of our great songwriters and lyricists were Jewish. Um, the, the lyricists for the song were a husband and wife team, Alan and Marilyn Bergman, you may be familiar with them. And the music is by a great, great composer. He's also a conductor, a pianist, and he died last year. And, uh, it's another way to honor him, Marvin Hamish. A song that talks about um, memories. <laughs> Thank you. 
Chancellor also for the beautiful music this evening. So our speaker tonight is somebody that I think most of you know. Mark Cousins is a labor attorney and arbitrator who has spent more than four decades representing labor organizations and their members. He is also an amateur historian. His previous work, the AFT in Michigan, was published by AFT Michigan. Mark served on the executive board of the Birmingham Temple from 1982 to 87, including a term as president. In preparing the book to be published in the near future by SHJ, he organized a myriad of original source materials, created the Birmingham Temple archives, and interviewed numerous individuals critical to the creation of the temple and humanistic Judaism. His work and his presentation tonight is based on this research. Please join me in welcoming Mark. Temple in the Detroit area, and he said he was certain that there was. 
Sue then asked Sherwin if he would attend a meeting to discuss the potential for creating a new organization, and Rabbi Wein agreed. On August 21st, 1963, about 15 couples attended a meeting at the Oak Park home of Lois and Dick Lord. The agenda was the potential for a new temple, but little was accomplished except the voicing of complaints about Rabbi Hertz and the location of Bethel. Most people at that meeting wanted to frighten the Bethel leadership. Few were actively interested in creating a new organization. But eight couples were not satisfied to leave the dis uh, discussion there. They had no interest in simply improving Bethel. The eight were committed to forming a new temple, and they agreed to meet again. On August 28, 1963, a week after the first meeting, the eight families met at the Vilek home in Oak Park. The families in Sherwin discussed forming a new organization. All wanted something fresh. Everything in the new organization was to be subject to inquiry or question. By contrast to Bethel, where there were simply uh, certain questions that were not asked, and if asked, were not answered, the group wanted information. Despite the unconventional beginning, the group was prepared for a standard reform temple. Ideology was not discussed at this meeting. No one proposed anything radical. The organization was to be different primarily in location and size. Geography determined the group's name. Sherwin Wine suggested that a geographic name would best identify the group, and the group anticipated it would someday wind up in the Birmingham area. Hence, at the first meeting, the new group became the Birmingham Temple, now located in Farmington Hills. <laughs> the group decided to uh, conduct the search to see the extent of interest. It concluded that the effort would be successful if 30 people attended. The first service was scheduled and took place on Sunday, September 15, 1963. About 80 people attended, a very good turn. The service was short, the Union Prayer Book was used with standard reform prayers, including theistic language. The service was a success. The group thus planned for a regular service each Sunday with Rabbi Wine as leader of the new congregation. Sunday services were necessary because Sherwin remained committed to his congregation in Windsor and conducted services there on Friday. But Rabbi Wine saw potential in the Birmingham Temple. He soon notified uh, Windsor Temple Bethel that he would leave at the end of June 1964 to lead the new organization. The structure of the temple was evolving, and the temple was committed to a future. The group had exceeded its initial goal of 35 members, and it was time to formalize the organization. The leadership decided to hold an official congregational meeting. This meeting would elect officers and begin the process of adopting a constitution. The meeting would also declare that the temple was permanent. This uh, meeting was scheduled at Eagle School, not far from here, on Sunday, November 17, 1963, after the regular service. A constitution was proposed. Harry Vilek was elected president with four officers and 16 trustees. The election of officers signaled the formal beginning of the Birmingham Temple. And so the temple ended 1963 with a rabbi, about 40 members, $1,134 in the bank, and a commitment to the future. While no one could foresee what the future would bring, they knew it would be exciting, that it would be challenging, and it would make a significant contribution to the Jewish community. Ahead was a year of controversy and challenge, of members who could not tolerate community criticism, and members who could. But that was to come. For now, these pioneers had a tunnel. Let's talk now about the evolution of the service. Because of the many stories that explain what the Birmingham Temple has become, none is more interesting than the evolution of the service. The humanistic service used tonight is no longer controversial. How it got that way is a story worth telling. Because the Birmingham Temple service was once very controversial indeed. The founding members of the temple were committed to free inquiry. Members were encouraged to ask questions, and in the winter of 1963-64, the members asked some interesting questions. <coughs> These questions arose from a series of discussions that began in a casual manner in the late fall 1963. 
The discussions were oriented primarily around the definition of God. In November 1963, the study group, an adult education committee, discussed what is our concept of God. And in the same month, Lee Berman, a psychiatrist, led a service in which the premise of God as an ideal man was introduced. Now, these discussions were predictable. It was difficult for many of the 40 temple members to contemplate an anthropomorphic god, an old man with a long beard and a cane. But no one was quite ready to abandon the concept of God altogether. Indeed, that suggestion was not made. But after considerable debate, most members agreed that God was the best in man. God was what man would become the highest achievement of men. God was not a super being capable of absolutely anything. God was what men could be. Virtually the entire congregation became involved in the debate about God as an ideal man. This was, after all, a radical notion. Such questions were not often asked by members of other congregations. God didn't need to be defined. God was God. But the Birmingham Temple membership was not ready to accept that conclusion. The issue took over the congregation. The discussions became intense, some lasting into the early morning, and the issue would not go away. And it didn't get resolved with ease. Some members left because they could not tolerate the question even being asked. For some, there was no basis for asking for a definition of God. To even ask the question was unacceptable. But for others, the question and the answers that follow were very exciting indeed. When God became an ideal man, talking to God was no longer possible. But talking about God was. Hence, a completely new service had to be written. Rabbi Wine spent much of his time writing these services. Sherwin would write a service, and the ritual committee would discuss it. Every word became important. <laughs> Harry Vielek told me that as they pounded away at Sherwin over words and commas and paragraphs, he would respond to their statements by saying, all right, I'll put two checks next to that. <laughs> the first original service was written for presentation <coughs> March 1st, 1964, less than six months after the temple's first service. In 165 days, the temple had evolved from using a standard reform service to using its own original services. The new service was a radical departure from the standard reform service. The form was theistic, but the message was humanistic. Traditional prayers were included, but the prayers taught about God, not to God. Now, this transition was not by any means complete in a single week. However, the adoption of the new service marked a significant turning point in the direction of the temple. It is one of the many forks in the road that marked the temple's progress toward a humanistic philosophy. And the Mark's first service was the beginning of this transition. More change was to follow, but the evolution of the temple had begun in earth. About five services were created between the beginning of March and the end of April 1964. The text of these services is in the book. I will not drone on uh, about them right now. The new services were consistent with the evolving philosophy of the temple. Services didn't threaten most members. The new services kept the most significant parts of the traditional reform service. So the Shema and Kaddish remained. The Torah remained. And most of the services included the Torah reading. Thus, the format of the service didn't abandon the anchors of a traditional Reform Judaism. But in March, April, and May of 1964, the temple presented a new service almost every week. And the services continued to change. The routine Torah reading was eliminated quickly. The temple dedicated the Torah on April 26, 1964, but Sherwin's sermon that night was titled, Should the Torah Reading Be Eliminated? <laughs> In fact, the Torah and the Ark began to appear at the service, but the Torah reading was completely abandoned, although the doors to the Ark were open for each service. 
The new services contain printed references to several theistic rituals. But like the Torah reading, one by one, they too were dropped. The Shema, and finally the Kach, of the Galilee. During the spring of 1964, all ties to the old reform service were cut. The withdrawal of these traditions met with some vigorous opposition. Some members left the temple unable to tolerate this dramatic departure from custom. These persons asserted that these prayers weren't just tradition, they were what identified Jews. These persons argued that whatever the meaning of the words, this is what Jews do, and the termination of these rituals somehow marked the fact that the Birmingham temple was not Jewish. But Rabbi Wine responded by explaining what the prayers actually meant. And it became clear that it was not what one said that mattered, but how one felt. He Mato meant a great deal more than Shema and Yisrael. Most members agree. The dropping of these prayers was a change that could not and would not be undone. The temple had crossed a line that could not be redrawn. The abandonment of the traditional prayers made all prior services obsolete. New texts had to be written, and the process of converging from the form accelerated. Now what followed? By the summer of 1964, the Birmingham Temple had generated a considerable amount of interest in the community. There was a great sense of excitement among the membership as the process of creation and experimentation caught virtually everyone. But news of the temple was not confined to the membership. The word was out about the new organization. Services were being attended by hundreds of people. The house was packed full every Friday. But for some, the services provoked more than simple curiosity. On October 12, 1964, Temple Israel Rabbi Leon Fromm wrote to Rabbi White. The letter invited Sherman to a meeting of the Michigan Association of Reform Rabbis. It was clear that this invitation was not just a drink tea. <laughs> Sherwin, unafraid, agreed to attend. The meeting was held in late October 1964. Present at the meeting were the rabbis of the five principal reform congregations of, in the Detroit area. Rabbi Fromm wanted to know whether the rumors are true. Had God been eliminated from the service? Was the congregation still reformed? Sherwin acknowledged that it was true. The service had been modified, and the Birmingham temple was not reformed. The rabbi's reaction was astonishment and disbelief. The group could not believe that Shirley Wine had chosen so dramatic a strategy. It didn't matter what Rabbi Wine believed. What mattered was vocabulary. God vocabulary was essential. To reject these words would be socially unacceptable. A change in form would be self-destructive and would threaten mainstream temples. No reasonable person could advocate this philosophy. Sherman Wine was unimpressed. <laughs> there would be no changes. The meeting was another milestone <laughs> in the temple's evolution. The temple had formally acknowledged that it had separated from the reform movement. It was something different, and the temple would not back away from what it believed in. But the rabbis were not the only persons interested in what was happening at the Birmingham Temple. The community was talking about this new institution, and a few members were concerned. Some were facing criticism from friends and neighbors. One member wrote President Terry Bielek that the temple was the primary topic of conversation at a bar mitzvah the member had attended at another temple. The member wrote, people in our temple are finding themselves in the position of defending that which may not be defensible. It is causing our own members to develop hostility toward others merely because we are being attacked. And the board minutes reflect a growing controversy. The November 8, 1964 minutes notes that a few families had dropped their membership and some had asked for a refund. And a few, in fact, a few refunds were authorized. But the controversy revolving around the temple's philosophy was just beginning. The Birmingham temple had been a focus of considerable discussion throughout the Jewish community, but there was little publicity outside the Jewish community. 
<laughs> the absence of external publicity no doubt helped the temple grow. The spotlight of intense attention would have made it more difficult for the temple's philosophy to evolve freely. A long newspaper strike proved fortuitous. <laughs> Neither the Detroit Free Press nor Detroit News was published between July 13, 1964 and November 25, 1964. Hence, there were no stories about the new temple. But the strike ended, and almost immediately after, the temple became very prominent. On Thursday, December 3, 1964, the Detroit Free Press ran a story written by Kylie Ward, the religion reporter. The story started a chain reaction that continued for some time to come. The story was headlined, Suburban Rabbi, I am an atheist. <laughs> the story read in part, a Birmingham rabbi who has built his temple's congregation from eight to 140 families in less than two years declared Wednesday he is an atheist. His congregation, he said, has known this for some time and by and large agrees with his philosophy. On a simple, popular level, I'm an atheist, said Rabbi Sherwin T. Wine at the Birmingham Temple, but in a sophisticated sense, I don't know. I would object to being called atheist when it has the immoral meaning that society has given it. The story continued. Rabbi Wine is convinced there is nothing that can be done to discipline him for his beliefs. Reform Judaism, said Rabbi Wine, <clears throat> has no provision that I know of for discipline except for a reprimand for such thing as embezzlement. <laughs> the story sought reaction from others in the Jewish community. It continued, other reform rabbis take a different view of the matter. Many have preached against Rabbi Wine without naming him. Rabbi Leon Fromm of Temple Israel is, like Wine, a reform Judaism rabbi. He agrees with Wine on one point, that in the whole of Judaism there is no discipline on such matters, but adds there is a duty to inform the community that this is not the Jewish position. Uh, I would say an atheist should hire a hall downtown and not go into the suburbs where people hear of a Jewish congregation that teaches there is no God. It seems strange to organize a congregation that teaches reaction to the story was immediate. It was picked up by wire services and relayed around the country. Dozens of newspapers reprinted the free press story or a variation of it, and virtually every paper in metropolitan Detroit printed a story about Sherman T. Wine and the temple. The publicity and the interest in the temple did not abate. The identification with atheism could have been the kiss of death and it became important for uh, the temple and Sherwin to shift the rhetoric. Another label was necessary. The Royal Oak Daily Tribune <coughs> wrote a story on December 14th. The headline read, Atheist? No. Humanist, says Rabbi, who puts man at center of destiny. The story quoted Rabbi Wine as saying that atheism is the wrong word for his philosophy. He uh, prefers the word humanist. On December 9, 1964, the Observer newspapers carried a story uh, headed, Rabbi Fields newspaper misinterpreted his views regarding belief in God. Congregation backs him completely. The text of the story labeled the temple's philosophy as humanistic. And in late December, Sherwin Wine was a guest on the WJR radio program Sunday Supplement, and the interview transcript reveals Sherwin's denial of atheism and emphasis on what is called agnosticism. Sherwin referred to the temple as a humanistic congregation. He said that the temple was not unique because there were other rabbis who agreed with the temple's philosophy but used other ones. The publicity continued throughout the month of December. The event was a cause of comment in dozens of congregational newsletters and in newspapers everywhere. Clippings from numerous papers are in the temple archives, and that represents a fraction of the reports. The publicity resulted in Rabbi Wine being flooded with telephone calls and letters. Many were hostile, and services were mocked. 
Some threats were expressed, with an occasional visitor shouting out epithets from the floor. Some visitors were weird. <clears throat> <laughs> The temple board began to post guards at the doors and around Rabbi Wan. An unconfirmed story suggests that the guards were to take their jobs seriously. Attributed to one temple leader was the instruction that if they start shooting, throw yourself in front of Sherwood. <laughs> temple membership had its share of sacrifices, but no one ever imagined that taking a bullet would be one of them. <laughs> As 1965 began, the onslaught continued. The publicity about the temple and its atheist rabbis spread around the country as the wire services repeated the stories in nearly every city that published a newspaper. The publicity brought with it numerous requests for information. Rabbis from several cities wrote for copies of the temple services. And Rabbi Wine became and remained a popular speaking with, uh, speak, speaker with uh, speaking engagements in a number of cities. But the opposition did not let up. A column in the Jewish Post and Opinion by a Reformed scholar complained that Sherwin was lying and that the Jewish congregations in Detroit, in order to protect themselves from the teaching that God is not necessary in Jewish life, should not associate with it and should not acknowledge it as a Jewish congregation. <clears throat> And in the January 15th Temple Israel Messenger, Rabbi Leon Fromm quoted the article and expressed his agreement. The Birmingham Temple should not be recognized, he wrote. And the Detroit news story titled National Jewish Groups to get story on Rabbi who is atheist, uh, Rabbi Fromm said the Birmingham Temple would be reported to the Central Conference of American Rabbis, presumably for the purpose of imposing some discipline on Rabbi Wine the temple, or both. But Rabbi Wine responded to Fromm, we are not members of the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, <laughs> and do not use the title Reform for our temple. However, Rabbi Fromm said, I think the Central Conference of American Rabbis could determine whether he can continue to use the title Rabbi under the aegis uh, and that of the <laughs> Union of American Hebrew Congregations could decide whether the congregation is to continue under the label of Reform Temple. Fromm continued, regrettably, there have always been Jewish groups who did not believe in God, but they were interested in Jewish culture, art, and literature, and the survival of Jewish thought. This Birmingham group, however, has no interest even in these things. It has a program aimed at losing all Jewish identity and becoming a sort of cult of self-improvement comparable to the New Thought movement. The publicity cost the temple its housing. The temple had used the Birmingham Masonic Temple since September. But, it, but the December publicity was too much for the Masons. They wrote the temple on December 29th, stating, A Mason believes in God. With deep conviction and without any reservation whatsoever, he affirms his solid faith in the supreme being. In view of these sacred tenets, it is understandable why the premises or facilities of any Masonic temple should never be available to any person, group of persons, or congregations that does not express a belief in Almighty God. Rabbi Wine and Temple President Felix arranged to meet with representatives of the Masons to discuss the event. The meeting began with one of the Masons saying, you don't believe in God? Harry thought he might placate them by diverting the discussion. Perhaps it would be possible to find some common ground. He stated, well, there's all kinds of concepts of God. I don't have a concept of God as an old man in the sky telling me what to do. But the ploy failed. One of the Masons responded, what else is there? <laughs> With the rest of the group nodding in agreement. Harry then recognized they were in trouble. Rabbi Wine then tried the notion of God as an ideal man, but nothing worked. The Masons stated they were firm believers in God and they could not be associated with any organization that did not share their belief. The temple was asked to leave the building. No deadline was set, but it was clear the Masons wanted the temple out quickly. The Birmingham Unitarian Church solved the immediate problem. Minister uh, Robert Marshall performed the first of many acts of friendship for the temple. He offered the use of his church on Friday nights. The temple accepted and services began there February 19th. 
The publicity began to abate, and the temple had a home, albeit temporary. But interest in the temple remained high. On March 5th, the free press ran a story regarding a speech by Rabbi Wein at Flint Junior College. It quotes Rabbi Wein as saying, I believe the way to approach learning is with the empirical or scientific methods. In response to a question as to the existence of God, Rabbi Wein states, you have to be more specific. The word is too vague and confusing. I do not have a concept of God. I do not want to add confusion to a confused subject. <laughs> <laughs> and then Sherwin asserted that the word Jewish is not just a religious term. It is a cultural The publicity caused substantial stress to temple members. Membership remained steady at about 130 families, but there were many resignations, including some of the founding members. And the temple could not ignore the problem. In the March 15th newsletter, Rabbi Wein wrote, edited here, a member of our congregation recently confessed he is mentally exhausted. Day after day, he is subject to the verbal assaults of friends and strangers who find the Birmingham Temple a religious obsession. Many Jews who privately agree with the temple approach object to the public controversy. Don't we have enough trouble already? <laughs> Our problem, however, is not that we must always defend ourselves against such a person. Justifying behavior is a perfectly normal activity. Our problem is that the aggressor makes us defensive. Rabbi Wine posed and answered several issues that summarize the questions the temple members are often asked. One, why are you making so many radical changes? The answer was, we are not converts to a new faith. We are only giving honest expression to the irresistible training for our own education. Two, why do you ignore Jewish survival? The accusation that we are uninterested in the survival of Judaism is appalling. Our willingness in the temple is to attempt this experiment and endure the individual discomfort of change and assault indicates our concern. Three, why do you deny the existence of God? The existence or non-existence of God is an obvious irrelevance. Our temple does not exist to either affirm or deny the deity. Every individual member can reach his own conclusion. We are simply agreed that the answer has no effective bearing on how we solve our moral problems. The absence of God language in our meditation service reflects this neutrality. The real issue is the issue of our ethical goals. And finally, he said, there is no reason for defensiveness. What we are saying is really very ordinary and commonplace. If we can relax with our normalcy, and accept the right questions, then we shall be less troubled by the emotional disturbance or our active opposition. We shall then be able to pursue our practical objectives without diversion. On May 14th, the temple amended its constitution. The phrase divine worship was removed from the purpose clause of the document and replaced with worship. The practices clause was changed to delete, to delete an affiliation with Reform Judaism and the Central Conference of American Rabbis and Union of American Hebrew Congregation, inserting instead, this congregation shall determine its own ceremonial practices. The last connection with Reform was ended. We now call these events the controversy. This was a most difficult time for the temple and its members and leadership. We know that some people found it hard to be a member when the spotlight was so focused. But the controversy was helpful, too. It sorted out people who were lukewarm about humanism and who wanted to keep firmly grounded in the reform movement. If the, temple, if the controversy cost the temple its home, it found another. If the controversy cost the temple members, others replaced them. If the temple's philosophy was tested, it met the challenge. 
We are confident that the Birmingham Temple and humanistic Judaism will survive and grow because of the lessons taught us by those members who lived through and guided the temple through during these hard days. Those here today must recognize a debt of real gratitude to those who face the onslaught. We must recognize that many of those early members, and Rabbi Wein, endured a crisis a day and still stayed attached to an institution and a philosophy they respected. We need to say thank you to those courageous people. They built what we use. Thank you. Thank you.